Romans 16, verses 1 through 16. Now, the church goes through many different types of blessings and trials. And Paul ends this epistle with two of them. In these first 16 verses, he talks about the blessing of the servants that he works with. And he gives some very specific commands to those that are working with him and to the church and how they should respond to these servants. And then a little further, which in another issue is one of the great scourges of the church, and that is those who cause division within the church. And so he gives some specific commands of how to deal with that particular problem in the church. And we're going to take our next study to deal with that, uh, that for our entire study because it's such an important aspect to the church. And then last here in the 16th chapter, he addresses the subject of why has he, has he ministered to them? What is his purpose? And he speaks about the great mystery that God has given him to preach the gospel. And so we'll cover these in our last three studies. But this morning I want to talk about the blessing of servants. Now how should the church respond to its servants? And that is the subject here in this study. So read with me verse 1 of chapter 16. Now see if you can pick out some of the very specific encouragements that Paul gives here and encourages the church to do. He says, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church of Sencre, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of saints and to assist her in whatever business she has need of you. For indeed, she has been a helper of many, and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. Now sometimes Priscilla's name is referred to in Scripture as Prisca and Aquila. But here, her, the more lengthy usage of her, her name, Priscilla and Aquila. My fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their own necks for my life to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet my beloved Epanetus, who is the first fruits of Achaia to Christ. So this man was the first to be saved there in that area. He continues, verse 6, Greet Mary, who labored much for us. Greet Andronicus and Junia. This is a husband and wife team. He says, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners. So these two were also imprisoned with Paul uh, at this particular time. And so he says, my fellow prisoners who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. Greet Ampelias, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and Stachus, my beloved. Greet Ampelis, approved in Christ. Greet those who are in the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my countrymen. Greet those who are in the household of Narcissus, who are in the Lord. Greet Trophina and Tryphosa, who have labored in the Lord. Greet the beloved Persis, who labored much in the Lord. So this man was a very well-known servant who labored much. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. Greet Asynacris, Philagian, Hermas, Petrobus, Hermes, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philogius and Junia, and Necritus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. Now, how important 
are servants in the church. I mean, when you look at this particular list of servants, obviously they are very important. They were important to Paul. They were important to his ministry. And this is why he takes this time and to take special note of who these people were. If you read this particular study and just look through these first 16 verses, there are 26 individuals listed here. If you read on a, a little later in the, let's see, it's verse 21 and on, he describes eight more people who are with him at this particular moment. Now, he's writing this particular letter from Corinth. And so he He's got a whole bunch of people serving with him, helping him in the church. Now that tells me something very important, that the church is not a one-man show. It's not even a few people show. It it's requires a whole bunch of people to pull off a healthy church. In fact, the more servants within a church the healthier that church is. Now, do you know how many people are serving in this church? I asked my secretary the other day, because we send out a, a letter to all of the servants in this church every single Christmas. And she got back to me and she said, Steve, there are 193 people that serve every month here in this church. And she said, Many of them serve in multiple ministries, three, sometimes four different ministries. Now, I, I thought that, when I heard that, I just thought, wow, that is incredible. That is a sign of a healthy church because every single one of you is needed to pull off the ministry that takes place in this church. Now, that is, a, I believe, a sign of real love. It's, what, it's the result of God working His love inside your life. Why do I say that? Well, it declares in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Paul said, brethren, uh, he said, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an occasion of, for the flesh but through love serve one another. And so love naturally motivates service. So that's why I say the more servants there are in a church, the healthier that church is because it shows that people are loving other people. That love is what motivates that service. So that is critical to understanding. If you want to grow in your love relationship with the Lord, if you want to grow in following Christ, then love is what's going to motivate you to do that. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the fruit of the Spirit. Love is the fruit of real maturity, and that will always entail service to someone somewhere. So do you see that is the fruit of real maturity in your own life? And if you do, then you have to ask yourself, okay, who and where do I serve? Whom do I serve? I believe your service starts with the people that you live with, the people in your own home. That's where service is essential. Husbands serving wives serving. And if you're not married, if you're living with a roommate, I mean, are you a servant to one another? Are you a servant when you're here? I think that is truly an essential aspect of the Christian life. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul said, the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body 
for the edifying of itself in love. So every part of the body of Christ, which is you individually, you are a part of the body of Christ. So every part, as it does its share of serving, serving someone somewhere, is what causes the entire body to grow and to mature. It says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, he says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. As each one has received a gift. That is talking to you. So each one of you has received at least one spiritual gift and you are to then, if you're going to be a good steward of God's grace given to you, you are going to use that gift to minister to one another. That then supplies your part of service. So it is essential. Now, do you realize that the Lord is looking for servants? He's looking for someone to serve. And he's constantly looking for someone to serve. This is what the scripture declares. Let me just give you a couple of examples. In 2 Chronicles 16.9, there it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. So the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro constantly looking for anybody that has a loyal heart towards him. Why? Because he wants to call you unto himself. He wants to call you to service. This is what he did with the disciples in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he, took, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them. I like that. He called them, and he calls you. And notice he didn't go to the rabbinical uh, schools in Jerusalem. He went and he called everyday individuals, guys who were fishermen, tax collectors, people that were just everyday individuals. And he called them to be his disciples. He did that then, and he does it today. It's an essential thing to see that because God has called you. How did Isaiah the prophet get to fulfill his particular ministry? I mean, in Isaiah 6, that entire chapter is given over to the call of Isaiah. And the Lord just said, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here I am, send me. So anybody that raises their hand and says, I'll do it, send me. The Lord will take and he will make you to become fishers of men, just like he took these fishermen who had absolutely no training in spiritual things, and he made them to become his disciples who turned the world upside down. Now, that's a powerful thought. That means every single one of us in this room has been given a gift of the Holy Spirit to use to minister to one another, and he will make me to become a fisher of men. And that's, that's his desire. That's his calling. Now, service is the way you, you maneuver and find your way through the, the questions, the maze of issues that people have. If you want to find what God wants to do in your life, start serving. Look for any place, any way that you can serve, and that is how 
you will begin to follow him. This is the way Jesus said it in John 12, 26. He said, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. Now, you can't say it any clearer than that, any more simply than that. If anyone, that means anyone in this room, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. So Jesus connects these two things together, serving and following. So if you want to be a follower of Christ, you have to find where and how am I going to serve. Notice he goes on to say there, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Does he call you my servant? I hope so. You see, he wants to call you my servant. If you're serving him, if you're being obedient to him, in whatever place or position or station you have, that is how you will be following him. And he, then he says, if anyone serves me, him my father will honor. And one day, he, he will honor you. He honors us even today. He honors us by filling us with his Holy Spirit, by having fellowship with us, by guiding us, providing for us, directing us, each step of the way. So I, I pray that you would see the church of Jesus Christ not as a one-man show or a few-man show. It's everybody's responsibility. We are the body of Christ. Find your place of service, what is your gift, and then do it. Do it unto Him because that is our calling. Now let's look at here some of the specific, some of the primary commands that he gives to the church about these individual people. Now each one of these commands that we're going to look at, I want you to see it this way. As we go through this, I'm going to relate each one of these commands that he's giving to the church is exactly the way he treats you. He treats you in a very specific way and then he asks you to do likewise. So as we go through these, remember that. So what is the first command here? Notice it's in verse 1. He says, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Sencre. Now this particular city, if you could put the map up on the uh, overhead, just so you see where Sencre was. Uh, you see Athens over there. This is southern Greece. Uh, Athens is there on the right-hand side. And then about, oh, it's about an hour and a half drive by car over to Sencre, and then, which is the, it was about six miles east of uh, Corinth. And Sencre was a, the eastern a seaport for Corinth. Corinth was a, in a very specific place, it, in this little isthmus, they would, they would take their, their goods and they would take it to, from Sencre over to Corinth and then they would ship it from there so that the ships didn't obviously have to go all the way around uh, these great many miles. Today, there's a little, uh, a little canal that they have dug through the, that little isthmus and it's like the Suez Canal or the uh, Panama Canal. And so all the shipping goes directly through that. But in those days, they would offload it, take it to the next city, uh, put it back on a ship, and then continue to ship it on. So these were two incredibly important uh, seaports. And so this is why Paul spent so much time in this particular area establishing the church. Now, the word here, commend, is a very important word. He says, I commend to you Phoebe, our servant, and our sister, who is a servant. The word commend literally means to stand with someone in an approving way. Now, this is very, a very important word, and it, it really requires you to understand what he's talking about here. This particular word is used in another verse. Let me read it to you. 
in Luke 9, 32. This is at the Transfiguration. And it says, But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and two men who stood with him. Now that stood with him, that phrase is the same Greek word here for command. He saw two men. Who were those two men? Moses and Elijah standing with Jesus, the law and the prophets. So Jesus was, they questioned him as to, is he, is he denying the law and the prophets? Well, no. To the disciples, he allowed them to see Moses and Elijah with him, standing with him in an approving way. So do you see the importance there? For anybody that questioned whether Jesus came to destroy the law and the prophets or he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, that little word is really important. So his encouragement here to the church for this woman is you need to stand with her. You need to stand with her approvingly. You need to encourage her. Now, why would that be important? Well, in those days, a woman had a very, well, under the Roman Empire, a woman was basically seen as property, as chattel. And so in the early church, it was a very important thing to hear what did, was Paul going to teach, what did Jesus teach about women and their place. Who is the first person that Paul wants to encourage the church to receive approvingly, to stand with approvingly? A woman. A woman that he calls the servant of the church. Now this particular Greek word servant is the word that's translated every place else in the New Testament, deacon. And so literally this is the feminine of deacon. Or So it could be translated here, she is the deaconess of the church. So this gal was a very important and a very important position within the church and Paul is speaking very approvingly of her now this is important because for anyone that thinks that Paul was a male chauvinist have you ever talked to anybody about you know somebody that's a non-christian and they go oh yeah Paul the apostle yeah he he was a woman hater you know he told women that they they needed to just be quiet and they needed to be seen and not heard. And submit to your husbands. Well, he tells some of the women in the churches, yes, they need to submit to their husbands. But he was in no way di dismissive of women. In fact, Paul elevated women to be equal with men, which was a radical thing in the first century, especially in Roman society. How do we know that? Well, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there the Bible says, Paul said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So there was no distinction between Jew or Greek, there's no distinction between slave or free, there is no distinction between male or female. Now, I guarantee you those were radical truths taught by the Apostle Paul. So when anybody tells you, oh, Paul, he's just a woman hater, a male chauvinist, you take him to Galatians 3.28, and you take him to Romans 16, and you say, look at his description and his instruction there. And he's telling the church, you know what? You need to stand with her in an approving way. Very important. Now, isn't this the way Jesus deals with you? When he has received you to himself, does he not stand with you approvingly? Does he not encourage you and receive you unto himself? Very important concept. Do you realize that one day he's going to stand with you and he's going to commend you when you stand in his presence one day? 
The scripture tells us in Matthew 25, 21, one day Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. That is what that declaration means. Well done, good and faithful servant. You're going to stand with him in an approving way. He's going to receive you. He's going to acknowledge your service to him. Oh, what a humbling experience that's going to be because we, we're going to realize I don't deserve any, any kind of praise because it was all your work within me anyway. But what an obvious description of incredible love. So notice here, I commend to you Phoebe. So who do you know that maybe needs you to stand with them approvingly today? Somebody maybe that has fallen and is, is struggling in their Christian life? Do you need to go up and stand with that person approvingly? I think that that would be an extremely important thing to do because that is what the body of Christ does. And so when a person sense that, it senses that distance or you sense that distance between someone, you need to go up and stand with them approvingly. Very important part of the body of Christ. Now secondly here, he says, receive her, verse 2. He said, I want you to stand with her approvingly that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of saints. Now that's another very important concept. Remember, this takes us back to this word receive is the same Greek word that is used in the seventh verse of chapter 15. Go back there with me in your Bibles. Romans 15, 7. He says, therefore, receive one another just as Christ also received us to the glory of God. Now, this word receive means to accept someone into fellowship. Now, he, is, he finished the, the specific instruction of this epistle after going through Romans 14 and 15, and he's telling them, look, when you, you get into these arguments over things that are really minor between you, things like, are you a vegetarian or are you a meat eater? Uh, do you worship on this day versus worshiping every day? Things that really are non-moral issues, they are not something to divide about with someone. And yet, many times Christians divide with each other over these minor issues. And he's saying, stop this. Don't do this. You need to choose to love one another and receive one another, accept one another in this loving way. And he says to do this in a manner worthy of saints. Now, you are called a saint of God. Now you say, well, does that mean I'm, I'm, I'm one of the saints? Yes, that's exactly what you are called. It literally means a holy one or someone who is separated unto him in love and in faith. So if you're a saint, if you truly have relationship with him, how should you treat other saints? Well, the same way you've been treated. You need to accept and receive others just the way the Lord has accepted and received you. That's just love. That's all it is. Each one of these commands really boils down to just loving one another. Stand with someone, commend them, stand with them approvingly, and he, then he says receive them. And you do that again by love. Now this terminology to, to treat someone worthy of a saint, notice there are several other ways that the same terminology is used. In Philippians 1.27, 
There Paul says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Now, it's not worthy as saints, but worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come to see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. So how do you have that one mind and strive together for the faith of the gospel? It's by love, simply love. That is what is worthy of the gospel and to conduct yourself as worthy of the gospel. In 3 John chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, there it says, Beloved, do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. There it is, your love before the church. If I send them forward, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you do well. So how do you, here he's referring to missionaries, traveling missionaries that came through their town. He says, if you send these people on and you help them along the way, he says, this is worthy of God. This is an action worthy of him. So, and take these phrases here, worthy of saints, worthy of the gospel, worthy of God, as really the kind of conduct that we should have one for another, which is simply to love. Show hospitality, show your love one to another. Now, again, here in verse 2, another word he uses, he says, assist her in whatever business she has need of you. Now, I really like this word because it, it means literally just to help someone, just to be a helper. Now, this is an essential thing because God is our helper. The, the Holy Spirit is called our helper or our comforter. And so God is given this particular, uh, he calls himself our helper. So he turns around and he says, look, I've helped you. I want you to be helpers one of another. And so he tells the church here, assist this woman. Help her in whatever business she has need of. So this is an issue that I think is so important. If you want to find your particular ministry gift, just start helping someone do whatever they are doing. I think that this is so important because it's, it's really a simple way to find and to just walk into your particular place of ministry. On Wednesday night, we, I say regularly, you know what, why don't you come in and help in our children's ministry? All you need to do if you sign up is just to be a helper to someone. You're not signing up to be a teacher. You're just signing up to be a helper, an aide someone that assists. Now, why is that good? Why is that important? Because when you get in and you start to help, all of a sudden you, you say to yourself, you know what, this is really not my ministry. I, I don't really feel called here. You, you will recognize that instantaneously or just the opposite. You'll say, gosh, I really love this. I love doing this. So if you see someone serving in some capacity, help them. Just say, I'm going to help you. I remember in my own life, personally, I was involved in a ministry, and this guy walked up to me one day, and he said, hey, Steve, would you help me by teaching this particular Bible study? And I thought, I've never taught anybody anything. Uh, I'm the guy that sits in the back of the class and never raises his hand. I'm the guy that doesn't ever speak in class. You want me to teach a Bible study? I went, well, okay, I'll, g I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a try. And so I helped a man do his teaching ministry in this, this place. And all of a sudden I went, wow, I really like this. I really enjoy this. This is something... I would like to do. He said, hey, would you like to teach another one? And I went, wow, thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll try that. 
That was the beginning of my ministry. So I encourage you, just look for where people are serving, what they're serving about, how they're helping others, and just say, I'm just going to be a helper. And you will say, I really enjoy this, or this is not my thing. It will manifest clearly what you are called to do. It's a very simple thing. In Acts chapter 18, verse 27, notice, when Priscilla and Aquila were in the city of uh, Corinth, they, they found Apollos, this man. And it says, when he, referring to Apollos, desired to cross into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to what? Receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. He assisted them. Same Greek word here as used in our text. So this man, Apollos, was received by the church, and then he uh, turned around and assisted or, and helped them. So look for that place where you can find that help. Now, the fourth and last thing that's described here in this chapter is the word greet. Notice in verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila. Verse 6, greet Mary. Verse 7, greet Andronicus and Junia. So this particular term, greet, why is that important? Why he says it over and over and over again. Because this is such an important aspect of, the, of church life, greeting one another. The word greet literally means to welcome and embrace someone. Now, if there is one charge that is made against the church of Jesus Christ, it is that the church in general, well, and I've heard the, the charge made against this church, the church is just a big clique. There's all these little groups and little groupies, and I can't get in to the little clique. Now, when that is stated, I can guarantee you, the church has not loved that person as it should. They have not received that person as they should. They've not stood with them approvingly as they should. They have not helped that person as they should. So it is a, an essential thing that we greet one another. I would encourage every single one of you to just remember what it was like when you walked into this church or any church for the first time. What does that feel like? Or the first time that you go to a men's fellowship or a women's fellowship and I can see you. I see you, but do you see this person? I see that person, they're standing there all by themselves, just kind of waiting for someone to say something to them. I hope that you have eyes to see that person because many times I'm standing and I'm talking to someone and I can see that person and they're just standing there or sitting there in the pew all by themselves. And I'm telling you, that's an uncomfortable feeling. Is it not? So if you don't want to be treated that way, you need to make sure that you don't treat anybody else that way. Because when you see somebody that is by themselves or you've never seen them before, you need to make a beeline for them. Because that's what it means to be a saint of God. It's what it means to be in the church of God. You need to be greeting others, loving other people in that way. And you say, well, Steve, I don't, I, don't, I don't like to talk to people. Well, you need to get over it. <laughs> because love casts out fear. It drives fear out of you. And love is what it's all about. And you're not asked to greet, you're not asked to come up here on the stage and greet everybody. Just, just greet one person. And anybody can do that. 
You just put your hand out. One of the simplest ways is to introduce yourself and to say, my name is, what is your name? Now, if you're like me and you have difficulty remembering people's names, you know what I do? I go and I write down that name. And the next time I see that person, I am going to go up to them and I'm going to say, hey, John, James, Sue, hi, how are you? And they're going to look at me like, and you know what they say to me? You remembered my name. So that is how you take someone who is a stranger and you make them a friend. You can't become friends. You can't welcome someone unless you really know their name. Can you? So would you try that? And would you ask the Lord to open your eyes to that person that you don't know? And ask the Lord to help you to to be welcoming, to stand up and welcome them, embrace them. Now, Jesus used this word to greet in Matthew 5, 47. He said this, If you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? So, are we, do we have anything more than unbelievers have? He says, unbelievers, tax collectors, greet their friends. So if you only greet those that you know, what are we doing more than others? Real love greets people, welcomes them when we do not know them. Now, let me end here with one particular couple in this particular church that I believe is of special note. It's in verses 3 and 4. He says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks, risked their own necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Now, these two people, Priscilla and Aquila, were very important people in Paul's ministry. He met them in Corinth. It says in Acts chapter 18, verses 1 and 2, After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy, come from the church in Rome, with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. If you read on in this story, it says that Paul actually lived with them. Priscilla and Aquila asked Paul to stay with them because they were of the same, they had the same trade, they were tent makers. And so believers, tent makers, they just, they came together. And so this couple became a helper to Paul. It says in 1 Corinthians 16, 9. Now this is written from the the city of Ephesus. And so Paul has moved to Ephesus. And here we find Aquila and Priscilla again. It says, the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So this couple, wherever they went, the church started in their house. And in those days, there, there weren't any church buildings. They met in people's homes. That's how they, they met together. And so this particular couple was central. They traveled with Paul, and he wa- they found they, had, they were kindred spirits. And they loved each other. They cared for each other. But the issue that Paul brings up here, which is why he makes such a special note about them, is that they were willing to risk their lives for him. Now, we are not told anywhere in Scripture what they did. It is assumed that just by the way he wrote this, that everyone understood what they did. They knew what they had done. 
Now, if you read the stories of Paul's experience in Corinth and in Ephesus, there are two similarities in both of those particular towns. There were riots in both of them. And it's interesting that as you read through the story, and I would encourage you to do so, you will realize that Paul is not in the middle of the riot. Either one of them. Other people are being beaten up for their faith in Christ. Why is that? Is it because Aquila and Priscilla shielded Paul? In Ephesus, it is very clear the scripture says there that Paul was trying to go into the Roman theater there in Ephesus, and they restrained him, saying, don't go in there, they're going to kill you if you go in there. So what did they do? Well, this particular terminology here, risk their lives, literally means to put their neck under the ax. That's what the Greek word and terminology means. To literally, they put their necks on the chopping block for me. So they were willing to give up their lives for this guy. That's why Paul makes this special note. Because that, I believe, that's just one cut above standing with someone approvingly. It's a cut above being someone who just receives you or assists you or welcomes you and embraces you. It's somebody that you're, you're willing to die for. So think about this t today. Is there anybody you're willing to die for? I hope so. I hope you're willing to give your life for Christ. I hope you're willing to give your life for your, your spouse, your, your children. I hope you are willing that you would stand in front of them if something was coming to, to hurt them. Would you protect them? And would you do that? I hope so. Because that is what it is all about. Now, that again is what Jesus did for you. He was willing to lay his life down for you. He was willing to go to the cross for you. Do you see why I'm saying every one of the encouragements here that is given is exactly the way God has treated us? And he's saying, this is what you should do for one another. So read with me this passage, and may, it, may you read it in a little different way today. In Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So if you want to be a servant, if you want to follow him, this is what it re is required. You've got to lose your life for his sake. So if you're playing with the world, you're trying to save your life in this world. And you will not deny yourself, and you will not be willing to give your life for anybody else, including him. And you say, well, why is that so important? Well, because life in the United States is turning against Christians. Do you re realize that Jews and Christians are the only ones that are looked at as intolerant today? You see, we're the only ones that have any kind of moral standards. We believe in God's commandments of what is moral and immoral. And I guarantee you, when you speak up in your place of business or where the people you work with or your family, all of a sudden you realize people don't look at Christians as being nice people anymore. Now, if you read the book of Revelation, you realize that anybody that comes to Christ during the tribulation period, they are put to death. Now, I believe that there is the rapture of the church, and 
Yet I don't know how much persecution is going to come our way before the rapture occurs. But are you ready for that? That's the question. You know, when I spoke up here on the issue of gay marriage, and we put that on our television program, do you realize that we got telephone threats against my, my life and my wife? Do you realize that you're, you're not looked at as, as somebody that is tolerant? And yet, those threats reveal their intolerance. That's the reality. They're the intolerant ones. Because I couldn't have said what I said any more lovingly than I did. Because I care about homosexuals, I care about them, and I love them, and I've ministered to many in my ministry. And yet, we have a moral standard that we must stand on. And that is not going to be uh, looked at as being a loving thing. People give their lives for Christ every single day around the world. And I guarantee you, you don't hear it. There are Christians that are persecuted and are martyred every single day. I have a, several websites that I look at on a regular basis that reveal where that is taking place. Just this past week, I had uh, Pastor Bob Caldwell from Calvary Chapel, Boise, a good friend of mine. Uh, he sent me an email, and uh, one of their missionaries in Romania uh, a man named uh, Adi Blaga and his nine-year-old son, Timoteo. These two were kidnapped and murdered in that country just this past week. I would encourage you, would you pray for his wife, Lydia? Uh, put yourself in her shoes. Uh, she's going through great trial and struggle. Pray for Pastor Saeed uh, Abedini. He is a man who is in prison today in Iran. He is also a missionary from Calvary Chapel, Boise. Bob is the one I went with who has an incredible ministry in India this past October. And their missionaries are persecuted and beaten on a regular basis. It's happening all over the world and you do not hear it. The news media does not report it. But it is happening. And so I encourage you, you need to, you need to be prepared. You need to realize you're, you're not uh, a favored one in our society today. And the scripture says the closer we come to the second coming of Christ, it says it will become worse and worse. So, are you prepared? If you are trying to save your life in this world, you will give in. If you want to follow him, he will make you a servant. He will make you to become fishers of men. And he will give you the grace to go through whatever comes your way. So, I pray that you will hear what is taught here in this particular text and apply it in your own life. Amen? Amen? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you today that you are a God who cares about each one of us. Lord, you know the struggles and the trials that we have and you stand with us. You stand with us approvingly. Lord, you have received us unto yourself. You have helped us by giving us your Holy Spirit. You have embraced us and welcomed us into your kingdom because you've laid your life down. You put your neck on the chopping block so that we could know you. Lord, I pray this morning that you would help us by the infilling of your Holy Spirit to stand in the midst of this day, the day in which well, you call an evil day. And Lord, I pray that you would give us, Lord, that strength to be your light, to love those that you send by our way, 
Lord, help us to look for the person who's by themselves, who's hurting. Lord, help us to embrace them and assist them in any way we can. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would truly make us men and women in this church who have no cliques, have no little groupies. Lord, I pray that you would help us to look outside of ourselves, outside of our friends, and to greet those that we do not know. Lord, help us to expand our, our vision and friends. Thank you, Lord. I believe you're doing that. Well, Lord, I pray this morning that, Lord, if there are any here in our midst today that do not know you, Lord, I pray you touch their heart, that you draw them unto yourself. If you're here and you don't know Christ and you believe, I, I, you know you're a sinner. You know you have broken God's law. Do you want forgiveness? If you do, all you have to do is ask for it. Ask him to come in and take over your life. He will empower you to turn from your sinful lifestyle and he will enable you to become his disciple. Do you want to do that this morning? Do you want that transformation of your life? If you do, will you pray with me right now? Just say in your heart to God, God, I am a sinner. Just say to him, forgive me. Jesus, come in, take over my life. I want to know you. I want to become your disciple. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. And help me to change and turn from my way of living to yours. If you're praying with me right now, you just prayed that to him. Will you acknowledge, yes, I, I prayed with you, Steve. Anyone here, just lift your hand and just acknowledge, yes, Steve, I prayed with you today. Anyone here? Because we'd like to pray for you. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we are in the midst of believers here today. And so, Father, we give you praise for your great grace. And Lord, I pray you'd continue to change us and to make us your own, make us your disciples. In Jesus' name, amen.